Great. So welcome to Claver Hill. Um, so this project, for those of you that haven't heard of it, is based um, just off the Ridge Estate in Lancaster. And it started, I think it was in the winter of 2013. There's a bit of debate around this, but I'm pretty sure it is the, the winter of 2013. And we will talk about the ways we grow on the site, the sort of peoples that come to the site, and we'll go into more detail the projects after this film. But for now, I'm going to share my screen and this film that's been made by Gina. So I'm just going to do that and enjoy. So I'm going to press Clover Hill is a place really rather than a big organisation. It's a place where people can have some space as communities to do things they want to do. When Joy and I first saw Clover Hill, it was just a field and it had nothing in it at all. Um, a big triangular field. And we decided that we wanted to buy it, which was a rather strange thing to do but that we wanted to turn it into a place where people could grow food. We also wanted people to come and do that as a community, not as allotments where everybody was on their own, but where people could learn from each other. Volunteers started coming and Spud Club started, and really that was, that was the beginning. And when people came, then more things started happening. Claver Hill is organised and run by the people who, the projects that come and work there. One of the things that we do which is about sustainability, uh, I'm particularly involved in one of the projects uh, which is called Spud Club, where we grow and share the food that we grow. People think it's an allotment but it's a community food growing um, venture. We try and decide and work together and grow together and share what we grow and pass on any excess food that we grow. Um, sometimes we sell it for a nominal price, um, a donation. We try and give it to people who need it and share it and we just try and make sure that those who need the food can get access to the food. Welcome to Horseshoe Farm Flowers. We're based up at Claver Hill. Um, I'm Martin and myself and my partner Laura, we run Horseshoe Farm Flowers where we grow cut flowers. Um, yeah, we have a passion for growing beautiful uh, scented flowers with no air miles. We don't use any pesticides or anything like that. So everything's fresh and natural. And we've been doing it on Claver Hill since March and it's just been fantastic for us. So 
the Lancaster Seed Library is here at Clover Hill and we're growing a whole range of different seeds from different types of beans, we're trying out a lentil, we have these Palestinian pumpkins, these giant sunflowers, uh, some rocket from Greece, there, there's stuff from all over the world here and we're trying to adapt it to the Lancaster wet and cold climate. Um, and it sits in the heart of Clover Hill. Um, we save some seeds and we share them with Spud Club. Um, and we also save some seeds from Spud Club to then share with the wider community. Hi, my name is Zia. And uh, I run a small project here where I can, uh, I, I'm just uh, training asylum seekers and refugees how to grow food, especially vegetables. So this project really encourages uh, all asylum seekers and refugees living in Lancaster to come at least once a week here and just to have to enjoy their time as uh, meet their friends just if they want they can practice here and the end of the day they can bring something home because uh, we are here uh, to produce things for them so yeah you know most of the time people come with their families children and uh, their children are playing here and then their parents sometimes they do practice gardening with me here and uh, they really enjoy it and I also enjoy it because uh, so far I have met like uh, more than 100 people from around 15 countries speaking different language and things so I really enjoy it. Hello my name is Katrina and I'm part of Sewing Cafe Lancaster and I'm here today to introduce you to our living demonstration of natural dye plants. Uh, we're interested in this really because we're so concerned about the environmental impacts of textiles in the world today. Um, dye is a massive um, contributor to, to pollution in, in many ways and it's also got many negative impacts on, on human health. To try and find a, a realistic and viable alternative for dyes really begins right here at home. Hi, I'm Enda and I'm also a member of Sewing Cafe Lancaster and um, have been involved in the growing of the plants and in the, the dye project. And um, I was just thinking there while Katrina was talking that um, the, the colours are absolutely beautiful of these plants and you know at this time of the year as well as being beautiful for people to look at as well as functional they also the, the amount of bees and butterflies is just quite amazing really. Transition Edible Nursery complements the seed library um, because it's developing heritage varieties of plants. So every year in around February or March we run a grafting workshop where we teach people how to uh, graft apples and pear trees and we use heritage varieties that we source from Backspotten Farm and other local gardens around the district and all the trees that we graft um, are then raised in the nursery and then we share them with um, community gardens around the district or for public spaces for gorilla gardens.
I'm one of the people who developed the Nature Trail with a group of ladies from the Reg. And we have many art installations along the Nature Trail. This is one we call the Beast. We also have many wonders of nature. We have an ash tree which is growing out of a breeze block. We have a little small forest with baby trees that have self-seeded. And we have lots of water features and a forage area and the herb garden and edible flower gardens that we look after as well. So I do hope when we get it reopened that you will come down and join us for a walk on the nature trail.
now there are more people now welcome <laughs> so um yeah so i really i'm so grateful to gina for creating that i mean it really tested all of her skills so and i promised that i'd feed back any comments that people have tonight so if you have any thoughts on the film please add them in the chat and i will make sure i pass them on to her um yeah and i i feel because this is a health festival the the one part of the site that didn't get talked about that much is the new water features on the site so you would have seen with the drone all of those big lakes and the series of ponds that go through the site and essentially because of um the changing climate the increased rainfall we're getting um the development the building developments that have happened around claver we've been getting more and more water on the site and it's been causing a lot of problems. Um, it makes it really hard to work on there during the winter especially, but last year it never really dried out properly. And so um, as well as being created and designed to hold water in places that enable us to grow food better, um, the water on the, that comes onto the site is also really polluted. And so the design of, of, of that system will aim to clean the water up before it heads on its way to the loon. So in terms of talking about health, um, cleaning up the water sources that come through our city into the loon is another really important feature that, and function that Claver is now doing. And along with that, with the water that's come, we've seen dragonflies, we've had ducks come on, we've had different varieties of birds come. There were loads of twitches around the site the other day looking for, is it a hoopy, hoopy, hoopy? What is it, Rachel? All right. <laughs> so it yeah, is yeah, a yeah, hoopy, I think it's hoopy. <laughs> yeah. I can't say so, if it's how you spelt. <laughs> yeah, so with that water has come a whole range of other critters to the site and it's really changed the feel of the site which is um it's been an interesting process a lockdown project so i i'm not going to talk anymore now i want to invite ah steve you've joined us which is great i wanted to invite um steve to talk about the the growing methods we use as part of spud club you're currently muted Right, okay. You got me? <laughs> okay. So, um, Claver Hill, when I first arrived at Claver Hill in 2013, <laughs> right at the start with a big field, uh, pasture land, and very little equipment, you have to think how are we going to cultivate this? And I'd been deeply inspired by a course that I'd done with Charles Dowding on how to grow without digging. And I said, if you want me to get involved, this is what I think we should be doing. So we grow on the site using the no dig growing technique as promoted by Charles Dowding, as he has used for many, many years. And it's been fantastically productive. It's been an entirely inspiring learning experience to create that kind of system on our site over a prolonged period of time and watch it develop and grow. No digging doesn't mean never putting a spade or a fork in the ground or never working hard moving things. Um, what it has meant is that we've cultivated the ground by marking out the ground with cardboard to cover our regular weeds and then putting a layer of compost on top, four to six inches on the initial year, planting potatoes for the initial crop, and then going onwards from there with adding an extra two inches of compost year after year. And two inches of compost has been enough to allow us to grow up to two crops, sometimes even three crops a year in a bed. And we are currently cultivating over 70 beds at Clover Hill using that technique and it has been remarkably productive. Not entirely weed free, certainly not work free, 
but very inspiring because we we grow without disturbing the soil we let the soil life do as much work as as we can get it to do for us and it has been quite remarkable we live and work with lots of moles voles the occasional rat mice um shrews and every other wildlife you could care to mention we are just part of that ecosystem and we're trying to do as little interference and let the ground help us produce the food that we work with having said that we have to cultivate plants grow the seed transplant them into the beds and as the plants develop and we harvest the bed is ready to take more crops so it's been a remarkable um sequence of working through a series of cycles and you're working differently I, i've worked in allotment in lancaster for around i don't know 25 years 30 years i lose count nothing has been as satisfying or rewarding or productive as working together to collectively grow the food at play the hill it has been easier it's been more productive i think partly because we're able to sustain the process of putting plants into the soil putting compost on the soil harvesting replanting and keeping that cycle going but also allowing time to appreciate what has been an entirely beautiful um working relationship with the people growing the food growing together as we work at work on that land it has been incredibly rewarding um, so if anybody would like to ask me any questions about that, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. Uh, but I'll also be very happy to be on site tomorrow for anybody who's around, to, uh, on Sunday, for anybody who's around on the site on Sunday. I'll be there all day. Uh, so I'll be available there as well. Um, just one last point about the Nordic system. It, when you don't keep on disturbing the soil when you minimize the amount of turning of the soil you're reducing the number of weed seeds that come to the surface so you're reducing the amount of weeding but we do get a lot of weeds to deal with but not nearly as bad as we would do if we had to keep on digging and working the soil and we are maintaining a very high level of fertility now that most of our beds have been cultivated for a couple of years at least um and i found that um we have a varying group of volunteers varying experience varying numbers during lockdown it's been a remarkable experience people have spread themselves out during the week while they haven't been working and the site has never looked better it has looked fantastic this year and lots of new things being created on the site so it's it's been an amazing thing to witness this year and i've really enjoyed working on the site this year as well so yeah. thank you to everybody for all of that okay anna is, is there yeah, anything else you'd just, like me to say just building on that martyrs asked a question about how did we manage during lockdown we essentially created a rotor that was shared via google documents and we allowed six people on site at any one time um, because the restrictions allowed that and Claver was exempt so you were allowed to go and work there and we had um, approval from the council to be able to continue to work there and had letters for all volunteers that were going regularly to help maintain the site because it's a food production site essentially. Yeah, um, yeah. and there are a few questions in here I'll answer them and then we'll see if there are any questions for Steve um so yes we have beehives now on the site they moved on in lockdown um are there i think there are two is that right or one one sorry i didn't i didn't catch that yep yeah, so we have one beehive on site at the moment yes there's one and yes yeah. yeah and it's a, a lady that has just gone through um the the National Beekeepers Association training and she's being mentored to do it as well so it's offered her an opportunity to learn how to keep bees um, and Melanie you asked about seeds um, so we have we have been growing some plants in the polytunnels and I've been isolating the flowers using mesh 
um, but and outside we grew crops in that wouldn't cross basically we spread them out in such a way that it didn't matter um, but for next year we've started um, creating well we've we've got a load of isolation cages from a skip from garden organic that we're going to be adapting for our beds and the sewing cafe have offered to help with that or victoria has anyway <laughs> so the sewing cafe will be helping us stitch some isolation cages for next year and in terms of organic certification we aren't certified and I've now learnt through the plot that Charles Dowding's technique isn't considered organic by the Soil Association. They won't certify sites that have the level of inputs that Charles Dowding uses. Um, so I'm just going through all of these questions right now. Um, hedgehog friendly ponds. I don't think I'm the best person to answer that. For the, the big waterworks that have been done on site, are they hedgehog friendly, Cathy? Well, um, that I can't answer about the big sites. I know the small ponds are, are hedgehog friendly because anything that accidentally falls in, there is logs and stones and things for them to get out easily for all the small ponds. The, the large lake that has just been developed um, we haven't actually looked into that yet, how steep the sides are, whether the, that would be hedgehog. That's something that we would definitely put on the list to sort out and make sure that they are. Yeah, and in terms of selling food, um, so Spud Club has um, like an informal agreement that surplus can be sold or distributed. It's not always sold. So um, we have distributed through the local community centre on the ridge. We've also done seasonal market <coughs> stalls. Um, but we also have supplied surplus for free to community meals or for a donation as well. Um, there's also a polytunnel on site that Steve looks after with a group of people um, that grows plants and produce for selling and they sold through the herbarium um, amongst other places and single step and the aim of that is to raise enough funds to cover the cost of replacing the plastic on the polytunnels essentially. Steve do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I think it's just a question of if I if I thought, thought we'd had one weakness particularly during lockdown we, we've had a lot of food that previously we would have might have been able to easily distribute to other groups who were active providing meals for people and it's it's actually been much harder to get more people to come and take food uh, we have quite a lot of food available we have the uh, informal stall available on a sunday afternoon where people can come and make a donation for some of the food that we have spare um, at the moment there'll be some produce available on sunday we haven't been running the market stall of the seasonal market so um, I think that's something we can get better at. Um, maybe we need to tap into some more people who can help us do that. Um, we need some people who are really interested in helping us find some outlets for our excess product. But apart from that, you know, I, I, I would endorse everything you've said, really. I think we've got some great food and there's always room for people to come and help and learn and add and contribute. Yeah, and we have we now are offering a £30 hamper via the, the Food Friends scheme as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can sign up to be a food friend and um, so it's £5 for a number per month and you're entered into a prize draw and you can win a £30 voucher for a local food business and Claver Hill's one of them. And all the, the money raised goes towards supporting farm start initiatives locally that support new entrants into sustainable farming. Um, yeah. So shall we hear from Zia? How has your project developed during lockdown? What else have you been doing? Do you want to share with everyone here? Hi. 
Well, during lockdown, that was really um, very special experience, especially for me and for my group. Uh, you know, asylum seeker and refugees, uh, they were already even before lockdown, so they were a bit, uh, I mean, not in very easy situation because uh, uh, most of them, they are not really allowed to work, so they don't have really too much engagement in their lives. So really, uh, they were in difficult uh, position there that uh, while this lockdown kept them more uh, in very tight situation there. So, well, really, uh, I'm thankful of this very smart uh, rota system was put by Clever Health Management uh, Committee. And that was really very much helpful in uh, uh, something that uh, really uh, a very a very a very how can I say useful organization uh, that uh, well uh, allow uh, most of the refugees asylum seeker in their families in their children that they could really come and participate uh, uh, as per their available time and uh, well mostly uh, in, in in last month we have started this uh, a new program we called it children summer activity and that was really people uh, really enjoy that there. Uh, so my experience with the lockdown was really very special and, and really as, as Steve mentioned that uh, I think so we worked more than the normal uh, situation because uh, you know we were more organized there so people were coming and their specific rota and things and then and those people were just not coming for nothing they're coming just to work and really the, 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 the productivity gone a bit high in the normal uh, situation so that was all again i can say that there was a smart uh, uh, rota system was placed and that's why so yeah most of people enjoy it and we produce a lot yeah that is a good point we did find that in lockdown we not only got more people coming up regularly just to work but the site looked amazing <laughs> and it still does yeah and see, you're you're cooking meals now as well, aren't you? Or you yeah. Involved? Well, that's yeah. Another thing that uh, this uh, some sort of well uh, idea came up from Global Link, and uh, we now trying to really in invite volunteers uh, to really cook uh, some special recipe from uh, a clever health products. And uh, that's something recently we have started in, uh, well, I think so, uh, we have already introduced around four new recipes. So program is that, that uh, people, uh, well, from different countries, uh, they just uh, take things from uh, vegetables from uh, Clever mm -hmm. and then they make their own recipe cook it, bring it uh, on Sunday around five o'clock and then share it with everybody. And then we uh, invite people's comment on that. And then in the following week, we are uh, sharing uh, uh, our recipe with the people. So that's another thing, you know, most of the asylum seekers, they were not very much uh, familiar with the most of vegetable produced here in the UK, especially Charles. Last year, we, we had really quite a big amount of Charles produced there. So then we did that thing started from there. So with this uh, well idea, we are trying to introduce new recipes and train people that uh, how to really cook uh, vegetable, uh, what was not really uh, produced in their country or with what they were not very much familiar. So this is some sort of fun as well that uh, people come and enjoy their time, especially around five o'clock there. In, and they, they they just have food and enjoy their time. Yeah, mm. and Kathy's also been creating a recipe book somehow as well, haven't you? <laughs> Well, um, I, I think so we can share, yeah, uh, we are also trying to uh, uh, well, uh, produce some sort of like a booklet, something that, uh, yeah, we can, we, can, we can work together and we can have a small booklet, Clever Hill Recipe, yeah, and that would be really useful. That'd be great. Yeah, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat. Otherwise, I'll just keep snaking around the people from the project. Um, so Katrina, uh, like, do you want to add anything about the sewing cafe's new project? And um, 
in the oh. video never said what you were doing with the boiling oh. and oh yeah okay have a, uh, can you hear me yeah yep. no oh good um yeah so soy cafe have been involved through natural dyes since uh well it was pretty much coincided with the start of lockdown really um we we've been natural dyeing at Sewing cafe for about three years um and it's kind of been a personal thing of mine really to kind of build and extend the natural dye project and when the growing aspect came along that that was sort of like a really great way to involve uh, the wider uh, sewing Cathy team and we already had people who were volunteering um, to, to garden um, at Claver Hill so and also Cathy has joined our natural dye team as well which is really great so i guess we were we were dying and getting a big interest in dying um both of kind of forage plants um but also we wanted to grow plants uh, another area of interest we're really interested in dying with food waste as well so there might be lots of choppings of leftover bits of vegetables and stuff that we can use so it, it was just a really um, great partnership between Sewing Cafe Dye Team and Claver Hill and the very, very good people of Claver Hill offered us some space to start growing dye plants. So from there, it, it's just sort of grown massively, really. So we've got two really wonderful demonstration beds where we really want to use those just so people could come and have a really good look at them and then get some really good ideas about what they can plant in their own gardens and then we've got some other dedicated beds in the garden as well we've got um, a fairly deep um, raised bed where we're growing madder because in, in dying you use the root of madder so you need a lot of space for the roots to grow um, and then we've also got another bed where we've got iris and we're going to also a, probably have a dedicated bed for wold and for weld. So we've got various kind of like motivations for our project. Um, mainly the starting point was around we really want to make a viable alternative to chemical dyes because we're really, as I said in the video, really concerned about the impact on, on health, um, both health of the environment and health of directly of, on humans of, of chemical dyes. Um, but also I think linking it to the health um, festival aspect, I think we've all found it's absolutely immensely satisfying to actually grow, dye and, and, and wear sort of things that you can actually, you know, you can follow through with the whole process really very much like you would grow, um, cook and eat. It, it's another kind of very holistic um, process. And I think particularly, you know, in lockdown, it, it's been a really difficult time for anybody. But if you can really get involved in, in a satisfying project with other people, then that's really going to do a lot for you. Um, I think we over time we really want to develop links with other aspects of Claver Hill. Um, we did run a really successful but very small dye camp um, when the restrictions allowed us to be able to stay away from home. And uh, we, we had an absolutely superb evening where Cathy had been really involved in clearing um, the site of, of docks, which, you know, a few docks are okay, but you don't want a million of them. And um, um, I sort of found out that you mm. can get a really, really good, rich colour of dye from dock root. So Cathy sort of organised loads of dock root getting cleared from the site. And then I, I made a dye at home. And then on the camp, we actually had a fantastic fire where we had the vat of dock root dye. We also made another um, dye from dock leaf. Um, and then we also made, uh, we had some carrots as part of our evening meal, which was cooked on the fire. And we made a dye out of the carrot tops, which was particularly nice. Um, so I've got all these sort of lovely fabrics behind. This is the dock root dye. So this is all of Cathy's efforts in gathering up the millions of, <laughs> of dock roots. And then we've got the, the dock leaf. Whoa. 
which was a, a lovely colour as well. It's a much sort of more golden colour. And then we're starting to also get results from the plants we've, we've grown. So I'll just flash you a quick set of uh, the, the Tadgetes dye that we, we made. So we've got some lovely, lovely yellow there. Um, and it, you get sort of, and also you can get really lovely green from the Tadgetes. So there's all some lovely shades. So that, you know, that's come out of Claver Hill this season, been in the pot and, you know, well, I won't say ready to wear, but, you know. Um, this is another aspect of the project where we're dyeing, um, mending yarn. These will go in the so-and-so boxes in little, in little wraps. Um, so we're getting a nice sort of collection of, of colours there. And this is Korma wool. So this is, a, well, the nearest commercially spun wool that we can get from Lancaster. So that's just a couple of miles up the road, so. Yeah, so the, the people on the, the team are, are myself and Victoria Frowson, Gina Frowson, Ender Oregon, and Kathy Barton, who's here with us tonight. Um, so I guess another, you know, we're really looking forward to things opening up at some stage. So we'll be we're very keen to like share with with you know people at Claver Hill, but the wider community as well about, you know, sort of sharing our knowledge of dyeing techniques and just trying to sort of inspire people that, you know, natural dye is out there and you can wear it. Just, you can't really see, but behind me, I've got this big display of t-shirts. My house doesn't normally look like this. <laughs> and there is an outfit there that is, that's um, avocado pit dye trousers. So just the stones of avocado. And then the, the t-shirt above is some actually um, a load of t-shirts that were left over from a conference in the year 2000. And they had a really horrible logo on them, but we've done like canvas pieces that are eco-printed and then the t-shirts the were dyed. And then that's a little buff that you can use as a COVID face covering and we've eco-printed that. So we, we, we all, all of the team helped out on the, uh, the eco printing at the um, our wonderful dye camp but I think you know I, I think we might be able to um, talk into spud club sometime about if they would like to do um, a, a camp as well and then we can um, they can have spud club t-shirts done in natural dyes which would be really good fun so I thank you got any questions <laughs> Yeah, and just whilst people think about questions, Katrina mentioned the so-and-so boxes. So this is another project that's emerged through lockdown and Victoria, who's not here today, is the force behind that one. Uh, so you may have seen a little library in the freehold area where people can come and borrow books and put them in. Um, and it sits on the wall of someone's house. Um, Essentially, the so-and-so libraries do something similar, but they have sewing equipment and materials and seeds that have come from the Lancaster Seed Library and other, other seed savers locally. And they've been put around Lancaster in three places at the moment. There'll be two more appearing um, and we're just trialing them out for the next year to see how they do. So have a look out for them. Um, yeah, so there's one on in Freehold, one in uh, Scotfirth, and one in near Scotch Quarry. And there'll be one appearing on the marsh, and hopefully one in Morecambe. So, yeah, look out for them. And who knows, they might breed and replicate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Katrina, you have a question. How much dye did you get from all the Claver Hill dock? Um, <laughs> How I far think, does it go? Oh, well, the dye that I made from the root made about uh, 12 litres of dye. But I guess with all of the dye on site, I think we could do an awful lot. I'm also um, trying to, I'm going to experiment next week with uh, making a, um, a dye from the dock seed as well, because obviously that's still there on the existing docks that are left. So I was thinking actually that could be quite beneficial all round <laughs> if we could make a, a dock seed dye. So 
Um, I mean, you do need a hefty amount of plant material to, to dye. You usually have to match the, at least match the weight of the material that you're trying to, to dye. And the, the more, the better. Mm. And Laura Martin have asked, could your dye be used on silk ribbon? Oh, it definitely could, yeah. S silk is one of the most, the best fabrics to dye. Oh, I see a collaboration there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, Any definitely. other questions around um, the Sewing Cafe project? Oh, Himalayan Bolson, that's a good question. Well, yes, I believe you can die with Himalayan um, Bolson. I mean, I think you would, I, mean, I think it's it's the, the flower heads and they're quite small, aren't they, compared to the, the rest of the plant. But yes, you can. And I guess removing the flower head is cutting out the whole seed shedding problem later so um yes it can be used i haven't used it but i would <laughs> yeah great um any other questions for katrina no? um yeah. on the silk ribbon note then shall we hear from martin and laura about the flower farm and how you, maybe a bit about how you got into flower farming. We've seen you in the video, Martin, talking about horseshoe flower farm. But. Hello. Hello. Um, I think our cats keep trying to make an appearance, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm Laura and this is Martin, and we're from the flower farm on Claver Hill. Um, basically, we got into flower farming about two years ago through our old allotment in Salford and it's completely transformed us, I would say, mentally, physically, socially, and I'd recommend it to anyone. Anyone who's thinking of trying to grow flowers, give it a go. Um, mentally, it's just the act of gardening has, I don't know, it's like a liberation, isn't it? You, you can focus on something and not be worrying about other aspects or other things and it gives you a new sense of purpose almost I think and um, and with the flower farm itself we wanted to a take on flower farming as a career b help other people feel like we feel when we grow the flowers and um, so we want to spread this ability to engage with nature enjoy being outdoors um, just think differently, like have a different experience. Um, I know that I think a lot of the people who come on to Claver Hill have a similar um, story or expectation. It's something that crops up quite a lot. Um, so I think we're tapping into the same kind of feeling really. And um, that's basically how we got into it. We've got lots of ideas for different community activities that we're going to be doing, some of which we're already starting. Um, we're just chatting to different people to get them going. But with coronavirus now, I'm not sure. <laughs> some things might have to go online. Um, we've been talking with Zia about doing um, like an autumn spring bulb planting session with some of the asylum seekers and refugees he works with. Um, so we've got that in the pipeline. We've been talking with another woman who's got experience in therapy and co-farming, which is something we're really interested in, like the social prescribing side of farming. And we're also establishing a mini meadow as well. So it's very exciting. And slowly but surely, we'd like to get involved with more people and, and do a big variety of things. And we can now get your flowers from the market, can't we, on a Saturday? Well, you can, but our market stall, we were going to be there tomorrow, but we've decided not to be because we're coming to the end of our season now and we don't want to be relying heavily on other flowers from other flower farms, even though they're all British. Um, it's not quite the same not our style, a lot of the flowers that they grow. Um, so we're still doing the garden gate shop, Friday mornings, 10 till 12, over the fence, obviously. Um, but the market stall has gone really, really well. 
lots of happy people, lots of smiles, and it's opened opened our minds to a few different things that we could do. Like a surprising amount of customers have come with ideas of their own community activities, which I've quite liked. So there's a few we need to follow up on that front. Um, we've got lots of Christmas stuff coming up, but we were literally just talking today about workshops. Are they going to have to go online? <laughs> I think I think they might do. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's what we've done. That's what we've got coming up. Uh, I've got some of the flowers here. If anyone wants to have a look, I think most of you have seen them already. I just went and got some. Ah, uh, nice. A minute ago, that's why I switched the camera off. <laughs> all organic, all healthy, very joyful. Brilliant. Does anyone have any questions for Laura and Martin? No? Great. Um, I wonder, Rachel and Kathy, you're the last two Quaver members to talk to. <laughs> Rachel, do you want to say a little bit about um, plans for activities for younger people within the community around the site and what you're planning there? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so for lockdown, really, we started having discussions like as the Claver Hill kind of group about really wanting to give opportunities for younger people, particularly those kind of from Central High School, which actually overlooks the site and from the Ridge Estate, which borders the site, um, a chance to come and get involved with things that are going on on the site, but also kind of design something themselves at how they would like to use that bit of land. Because I think what's happened, I mean, I've only been um, involved with Claver for maybe a year or yeah, a year and a half. I can see that what's happened is people have come, like the Sewing Cafe came with an idea and it kind of routes the project and then it becomes part of the site. And it's nice how things kind of come from people and kind of grow that way. So we wanted to try and find a way to support younger people to come onto the site and come and kind of come up with their own ideas of how they might use the land. Um, maybe getting involved in growing, but maybe it's other stuff they might want to do, like some conservation work or some kind of more building, getting involved with building projects. So yeah, we've been talking to um, both a local guy who does a lot of work in the environment, working with people of all sorts of ages um, with environmental stewardship, but also now linking in with people that work in um, in the Ridge community, um, as well as a guy that is actually grew up on Ridge Estate himself, to try and see how we can use funding that we've applied for to design a project that enables the young people to come onto site and then design their own projects um, with us and with everyone that's involved in Claver. Um, so yeah, we've put in a funding bid and we're waiting to hear about that. But we're kind of undergoing kind of discussions and also waiting I guess with COVID to know what we can actually do in terms of getting people on site in the next few months. Um, and then also we've been in discussions with the school, the Central High School and the community connector who works with the council, um, Jamie, who actually also has kids at the school to try and see how we can link in with them as well. Um, maybe do some volunteer stuff with, the, with their students and also with the horticultural program. So there's lots of potential links. At the moment it's all kind of Nothing's definite, but I feel that there's a gathering momentum of people that are interested and are willing to kind of give a bit of time to see if we can get some funding and make something, make something happen in the next, probably, it'll probably be starting, I imagine, next spring when the weather gets a bit nicer. Um, yeah, I met Jake from Ridge when he came up to the site, he was like, it's very windy up here. It's really hard to get people up here in winter, like, so I was like, oh, maybe we'll wait till March and April when it's lovely and sunny and it's, um, yeah. If you're young and it might entice you off a bit more when the sun's out and we've got the pizza oven going and we can be more sociable. Yeah and just to talk the pizza oven that originated from one of our younger members Fly. So she wanted a summer project last year and she asked if she could make a pizza oven and yeah Kathy, Dave and Fly have created this pizza oven that got launched this year and it works well and it yeah we've had a few pizza parties over the last few months as well but another part or another perk of Claver um so Kathy do you want to talk about the nature trail and also I see you as almost 
the glue of the site. You're creating compost space, you help look after the general health of the site. You're, yeah, I just talk about the things that we've lost or not spoken about yet today. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Nature Trail because that was really special because it was um, a group of women, most, all of us mostly were over 60, except we had one very young girl with learning disabilities who was um, 11. And we got together and we thought we wanted to do something. And, and the, the young girl said, let's make a nature trail. So we did. Um, and um, so it, it, it starts up at the top of the gate and it goes all the way around the perimeter of Claver Hill and then it weaves its way through Spud Club. Um, but now we're in the process of, of rerouting it because we've got so many new projects that we can include. Like I, I've got the, um, the sewing cafes dyed, dyeing beds, that's gonna go on it. We've got the flower farm, that's gonna be on it now. We've got the bees, they're gonna be on the nature trail. We've got the lakes and the ponds. So it just is, the nature trail has just got to be rerouted. It's just got so much more going for it now. And so we, but we also had, uh, when we actually launched the, the nature trail in 2017, uh, it was just the nature trail. And then the next year we said, okay, how can we make it better? So we started making art installations. Uh, so that was why you saw the beast in the film and several other art installations weren't shown in the film, but we have some and some that have um, been taken down temporarily, but we'll put them back up. Um, including a bathtub filled with strawberries and little fairies. So that we call that our fairy bathtub. And we had um, a musical instrument made out of scaffolding poles, uh, you know, a big black spider made out of black piping that somebody gave us. It's just, um, it's just a way to have fun, basically. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to learn about nature. You can walk around the trail and you say, ah, oh, there's some deer footprints. Or you can say, oh, look, look, look what the deer's done to that tree when he rubbed his antlers and he rubbed all the bark off the tree. Or you can look at the amazing dock beetles. I mean, I know, thank you, Katrina, for using up some of our dock, but the, the, the amazing dock beetle is like fluorescent green. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, so, you know, all these parts of nature, and like Steve said, we have to share our food sometimes with mice, and shrews and you know, who I, I won't mention some creatures, but yes, we have a variety of creatures um, that we share. Pheasants, the deer, they like raspberries as much as we do. Um, you know, so yeah, we share with everybody there. And it's, it's a good way just to have fun. Um, so once we get the, the nature trail rerouted and we can open it up again, if COVID allows us to open it up, um, it looks like it may not be for a little while, but when we will, we'll probably have like another grand opening, a second grand opening, because we've got so many new things going on. Um, and, and the flower farm, I mean, they came up with this um, wildflower meadow and everybody loves it so much that we want to create more wildflower meadows everywhere. So I was asking them, can we make one in the orchard? Can we make part of that into a wildflower meadow? And, and you know, we just, we, this is the way things happen. It's, it's like we are organic ourselves, just growing like a flower opening up and just more things sprouting and coming to fruition. It's, it's wonderful. So yeah, that's, I, I mainly just talk about the nature trail, but yes, um, I tend to do the composting and Steve's building me a brand new, really, really well built, um, six bays at least, but maybe we'll get up to eight bays, composting bin, as per Charles Dowding. And um, so that's, that's something, I mean, just, just watching compost grow is amazing. When you just throw in a load of brown and green materials, and then it turns into this fantastic compost. It's just, it's just amazing to see. So yeah, but, um, yeah, so if anybody um, wants to come and when we can work on the nature trail, um, help is always appreciated. 
because we, we do like look after the edible flower circle and we do look after the herb garden as best as we can but sometimes I must admit we get a bit behind yeah we need support for that so yeah if any of you are interested you can just contact us through the Facebook page or just come up to the site and someone will show you around um, so do we have chickens on site no um, there's been a discussion about this for a while um, I imagine if and when they come on there'll be quite a lot of discussion about it as well because we have um, a few members now that are animal rights activists essentially and they have they have some quite interesting information that they would like to talk about if we are to consider bringing them on um, so it's something that is still in discussion and it's not being approved oh wow Gina's joining us we should all tell her how amazing her video was <laughs> Gina, hello, everyone loved your video. Anyway, <laughs> um, keep asking questions in the chat. The, the part that I've realized that maybe we haven't brought out as much, when we first started Claver Hill, it attracted, um, as do many community gardens, lots of uh, very strong-willed characters that were interested in growing um, and so a lot of the initial focus of the project was on the growing and over time we started to I think realize um, that the project almost food was one outcome of the project but the community building aspect of it was really important and for some people that come to the site Claver Hill has become a really crucial support network for them. Um, and earlier on in the in the earlier days, there were a few conflicts that arose, as happens in any community project. There's the the phrasing about there's um, different theories around group evolution, and you have the storming, norming, performing phases. And we definitely had our own um, challenges, and we use this process called dragon dreaming which really um, quite early on we were lucky to have come across it I think it really bonded the core group and got us to think about the other benefits of the project and I just want to really emphasize that it really has become a support line I think for some of the members of that group who weren't didn't appear in the video um, and they weren't comfortable sharing quotes but it it really has become an important part of their lives including my own as well um does anyone want to ask any other questions or want to learn more about a part of the project that we've not covered um just speak up or type in the chat if you have something that you'd like to find out before we part ways no brilliant so i guess we will we'll stop there so steve do you want to say something oh and zia yep steve yes please 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 i just wanted to say a big thank you to to anna for pulling us all together to to um to putting this together and 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 the fantastic work by gina um, and it's that organic way that everything just happens at Claver Hill and happens amongst the group. I just think it's fantastic and it's been an amazing experience for me working at Claver Hill for, you know, as a volunteer for all those years, all these years, and it's been just a fantastic thing. And I look forward to us doing great things in, the, in future days, weeks, months. It's just so exciting so great to work with everybody um yeah. but um yeah I, i'm just sort of very very grateful to to have that fantastic asset within our community okay and if i've missed a question there it's because 
I only half heard what Anna was saying, so I'll hand over to Zia. Okay. And um, yeah, and just to say, um, the video will be shared. It's not quite a hundred percent okay to share, put it, publish it yet, but I can send you to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. Zia. Yeah. Well, it's worth to mention here that really um, I'm very much thankful of uh, friends from City of Sanctuary, especially Dorotaya, who really helped uh, our projects. And uh, she, every Sunday, she tried to bring uh, asylum seekers and refugees uh, from around the town to Kleber. And then if really they want, uh, she can uh, bring it back home. In addition to that, that uh, she always bring uh, surplus uh, of our production there, especially uh, produced by refugee projects uh, uh, to those refugee asylum seeker houses who are really unable uh, to come and report to Clever Hill to collect if they need something, especially people with disabilities, especially people with children. So uh, this is really worth to thank her and the City of Sanctuary uh, for helping us uh, in running this project. Yeah, that's a really good point. And there are so many of those people that we've not thanked and mentioned that have been key to supporting the project over the years. Gina, are you there? Uh, I don't know if you are, but thank you for making the video. Everyone loved it. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you more feedback later. Um, Okay, so thank you everyone. I think we can finish there and finish a little bit earlier. I hope you enjoyed this session. Um, I'm going to be emailing everyone um, with an evaluation link to just let us know how you found it so we know if we should do similar events in the future and it will help shape the Lancaster Health Festival next year. So I am going to stop recording now.